Thank the Lord for all he's done, right? That's the one thing you can give God that he hasn't given you. That's thanks. The breath you used to give it to him, he gave you. But the thanks you can give him. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 with me this morning, please. Church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. And verse number 4. And we'll start reading verse number 3 to get a little context here of what the Apostle is talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3. The Apostle Paul said, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Father, in thy name we pray now that you'd anoint the word as it goes forth. The word is perfect. May it find good ground to fall on. And Father, I pray that you'd anoint this messenger this morning. Give me unction to preach it. In Jesus' name, amen. I never want to ever lose the awe of knowing that I have God's word in my hand. And I'm standing here behind this man-made piece of wood. And I'm proclaiming to you eternal truths. And that is a privilege beyond imagination. I've been at this a long time. And I have been praying recently for God to make sure that I minister to my generation. As I've said to you before time and again. We have had outstanding men of God for 2,000 years, many that we don't even know about, Amen. that are faithful witnesses, ministers of the gospel that have preached God's word, labored in the fields. Women have done the same, laboring in the fields, Amen. gone to the mission fields. I'll never forget Marjorie Browning going to Brazil by herself, riding a mule back into the swamp to carry God's word to a village and then eventually, in the latter part of her life, to be murdered by one of the very people that she had been preaching to, that is Marjorie Browning. I'll never forget that. So you need to understand that a lot of so-called Christian celebrities are man-made and in the sight of God, meaningless. But my point is this. I must minister to you that are living in 2017. The church is facing issues today that must be brought to the forefront. It is absolutely incumbent upon me to tell you what's going on. That's my job. The Bible said I watch for your souls so that I must give an account. And I don't take that lightly. I must give an account. So I'm going to be saying some things to you this morning in the message that I want you to please listen carefully to. And that it's only beginning because I'll finish it up tonight. And I ask you to come back if you want to get what's left and the important part about what I've been preaching. You can come back tonight and you can hear more and it will open up more for you to begin to understand where we are. If anyone comes to you preaching any other Jesus, the Apostle Paul said in the book of Galatians, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed. There is a true Christ and a fake Christ. And I want to preach a message this morning on the true Christ versus the fake Christ. Well, I'm sad to say that we live in a generation today that cannot tell the difference. And the fake Christ is being preached Sunday after Sunday after Sunday in the churches throughout this land and all over the world. And that's sad. That's very sad because the people are apparently are ignorant to the truth and therefore they allow this to happen. If the people knew the Bible and understood the teaching of Scripture, They'd throw these characters out in a heartbeat, but they don't do it because they don't know the difference. And that's what's sad because the Bible says in the book of Hosea that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And so I'm going to start with what little, uh, with, 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 a, with, a, with a beginning here about our Lord Jesus Christ and try to get you to understand the issues at hand 
And these are very, very, very important issues. Our Lord Jesus Christ was virgin born. Anyone that denies the virgin birth market down, they're not a Christian. They know nothing of Christ. They don't know anything about our Lord Jesus Christ. Or they may believe in following his principles or they may be, call themselves a follower of Christ and all of this. But if they do not believe in the virgin birth, they make him one of you. He's not one of us. He is from above. He said, you are from beneath and I am from above. And he is the Lord of glory. First man, Adam, was made of the earth, earthy. The second man, the last Adam, is the Lord from heaven. So he's virgin born. Secondly, I want you to understand something about him, and that is that at the age of 12, and this is where I get into the meat of what I'm saying, at the age of 12, he was taken to the temple, and as a pork-abstaining, Sabbath-keeping Jew, he was raised as a Jew, he never one time renounced the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not one time. He said, all the scripture, every jot and every tittle will be fulfilled. He said, Abraham, Abraham, he spoke highly of Abraham. Every time he made reference to Abraham, it was always positive. But he had his bar mitzvah when he was 12 years of age. The bar mitzvah literally means a son of the law. The Lord Jesus Christ was brought into this relationship that his, that his mother and his, and his earthly father, stepfather, had brought him there. But here's where the rub starts this morning, and listen carefully to me. From the age of 12 until he stood there in that river and was baptized by John the Baptist at 30, there's an 18-year span of time, 18 years. There's a period of time there that is called the silent years of our Lord Jesus Christ. And believe me, that during this period of time when no holy scripture was being written, the devil certainly has filled in the vacuum and he has tried his dead level best to destroy the truth of Christ. You say, what do you mean, preacher? I mean this. I mean that you have never seen the gospel of Christ, the identity of the Son of God, assaulted like it is today from every direction. You have a man like Dan Brown who became a multi-millionaire by writing fiction about the Lord Jesus Christ, having Mary Magdalene as his lover, and their children became the kings of France through the Morovingian dynasty. That's garbage, folks. There's no literary foundation. There's no authority for that. It does not exist. But you do have, as I've said to you time and again, a volume, a bunch of volume of books called the Gnostic Gospels that were written in North Africa. They were written about 200, 300 AD, somewhere in there. After the completion of the canon of Scripture, when the Apostle John wrote the last book of the Bible, he wrote the book of Revelation, he wrote the last gospel of the Bible, which is the gospel of John, God shut the book. And anything that shows up after that is spurious. It is man-made is a fabrication it's a creation from hell itself but now we've dealt with dan brown this morning i want to come at this from a different direction you not you not only have dan brown assaulting the identity of christ saying he married a woman had children by her you find this in the gnostic gospels the gospel of thomas for example talks about christ kissing mary magdalene all kinds of blasphemous garbage it's all out there been out there a long time but it is these 18 years between the time he was 12 and the time that he was 30 when he came and stepped forward for his public ministry. The apostle John the Baptist baptized him in the Jordan River. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove and anointed him. He, the Bible says in the book of Acts, he anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and the Holy Ghost. He was anointed of God. The anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ was the anointing of God upon God. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand. Thy God, even my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is God himself. He's God, a very God manifest in flesh. Any deviation from that and you are in the Gnostic era and you're with the Hindu, you're with the New Age movement, you're with all the rest of the, 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 the Christ deniers. And here's what I'm going to deal with this morning. A Russian by the name of Nicholas Novotek, Novacek. A Russian by the name of Nicholas Novotek went off into India. 
He went into a monastery, I think it was in Tibet, and in that monastery in Tibet, he had a, a, a lama. This, these are their monks, a Tibetan monk, read to him from an ancient document that said that the Lord Jesus Christ, during this 18 silent years, when it's not found in Scripture, traveled to east to India and to Tibet and to these eastern places and sought out gurus and sought out Hindu holy men and sought out the great teachings of the ancient wisdom and he sat under them for years and learned how to perform the miracles that he performed because he had a great anointing come upon him while he was there and he tried to carry it back to Palestine and give it to the Jews but he was crucified by Pontius Pilate and he was unable to give forth the real anointing that had been given to him from the great spirit of the ages because the New Age movement, that's what it is, an impersonal force that's moving throughout the universe. It is that one that Plato talked about. So here's what they're doing. They're taking the identity of the Son of God, which is unique to himself. Nobody ever lived before him like him. Nobody ever lived after him like him. He's the only one of his kind. There's not another. Not another. But if they can take him and reduce his identity to nothing more than a Hindu guru then what they have done is destroy Christianity and they've elevated Hinduism. They've raised it up. They've raised it up before the people as the great wisdom of the ages and the new age movement. And it may not be called that today. It doesn't have to be called anything. All you've got to do is watch them. Listen to these people. Listen to what they're teaching and preaching. This movement has stepped into the church and I'm talking about mainstream churches when a preacher gets up in the pulpit and tells you it doesn't matter which way you go we're all going the same way and we're going to the same place you're dealing with a universalist and you're dealing with somebody who denigrates the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ and by doing that he is preaching now listen to me he is preaching the message of the Antichrist when he shows up. They're already hearing the message. They've already received his spirit and now they're waiting for the man. Amen. Are you following me? Yes. The message of the Antichrist will be universalism. It'll be regardless of whatever your religion is, just do good at it Amen. and we'll be okay. And that the Lord Jesus Christ to these people is not the Lord Jesus Christ that you're preaching and that you believe in. He is a mystic. He is someone who is enlightened. He is someone who reached this higher plane of understanding of spiritual truths. And he came back into Israel. He was sent back by the lamas. And he came back to preach to them and raise their illumination, their enlightenment, their mind to get them up from this earth and to get them to begin to understand that we're all God. All of us. And how, do you, how could that be, preacher? Because this all-pervading spirit of life that pervades the universe that's everywhere this is exactly what an evolutionist believes. I told you this this past Wednesday night. Every evolutionist out there, and if you're one of them, you believe it too. You believe that there's something going on out there. This didn't just come up from the mud. There's something going on out there. But you cannot describe it because it is a non-distinct entity, yet it is a spirit that's pervasive. It's a knowledge that's pervasive. It has a hand in bringing this evolution into what we know it to be today. 
That they have many of them have different they are, they have, many of them have many different definitions of what it is, but every last one of them refused to say that there is a Lord God Almighty seated on a throne that spoke all of this into existence. They absolutely refuse to say that because they are accountable to Him if they believe, accept, and 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 confess that He is God. Then they know that they've got to give an accountability for their sin. And they absolutely refuse to do that. So the spirit that's in the classrooms, in the colleges, the spirit that is in the churches, houses, the spirit that is running the governments, the spirit that is everywhere you're going to face it when you get up and walk out that walk, go to work tomorrow, you're going to live in the midst of people who have that same spirit. It's already here. It is the spirit of antichrist it is the message coming from di many different quarters with many different spins but eventually they're saying the same thing that we're all a brotherhood it doesn't matter what your religion is just do the best you can at it and we're evolving upward and onward and bigger and better and that is exactly what that man of sin is going to preach when he shows up and he's about ready to show up. Amen. Now, you can get into the details of this, and I'll cover a lot of this tonight. But let me just tell you this about the details of this Russian who went over into India, in Tibet. And in the 1800s, he published a book about the silent years of Jesus and like Dan Brown, of course, like unlike Dan Brown, he didn't become a multimillionaire. Dan Brown is a multimillionaire for his fantasy Disney World, uh, yeah. you know, scholarship. But unlike him, this kind of publication goes to the very heart and to the very soul of everything we believe as Christians. You say, preacher, what does he base it on? What manuscript authority does he base this on? Are you asking yourself that question? If you're going to come along and you're going to outright refute the Bible and you're going to tell me this book right here is not trustworthy and what God's Word says that I can't trust it, then my dear friend, you better produce something. You'd better come up with something. You'd better have something to show me that it that, that will prove what you're saying about the Lord Jesus Christ. Three scholars in the 1800s, three of them, three scholars in the 1800s, dug deeply into the authority of where this man got his information. And in one case, they went to one of the lamas, and the lamas said, we never said such a thing to this man. They dug deeper and deeper, and the man himself, the Russian, after he was now famous all over the world for writing this book, admitted that it never had been said to him like he said it. Amen. In plain words, once they began to do the scholarly research into the primary sources, folks, you don't believe anything just said to you, do you? Amen. Did you know that when that Bible said, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I tried it. It worked. He saved me. And I was one of the worst skeptics, agnostics that ever walked this earth. I was terrible. But I opened up that book bowed my head and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And when I raised my head back up, my sins were gone. I felt a peace come into my soul. I felt as light as I'd never felt in my life. I felt some joy flooding inside me. And it was day after day after day that glory and joy was all over my soul because I had been born of the Spirit of the living God, the Word of God, this book. Can you have thousands, literally thousands of pieces of manuscripts that attest to its veracity, that can be dated back to the first century after Christ, 
that can be dated back to the time long before the Gnostic Gospels and long before any so-called trip to Hindu into the Hindu world or the Buddhist. The ancient authority of what I've got in my hand is the Word of God. There's more manuscript authority for this book I've got in my hand than there is for the Declaration of Independence. Amen. So why? Because there's far more of these than there is the Declaration. And I believe the Declaration of Independence is genuine. How many of you believe that? Amen. I'm glad you do. So what has happened under your very nose while you're, while, while you're going about your daily affairs is that some of you have children some of you have family members that are going to churches right now where their so-called preacher gets up in the pulpit and he tells them, it's okay, Jesus is a way, but there are other ways too. He gets up in the pulpit and he tells the people, you know, homosexuality is really not all that bad because it's just another sin if they call it a sin. He gets up in the pulpit and he begins piece by piece by piece to undermine your very faith. These churches today are turning out universalist. People are so offended today. I've never seen anything like it in my life. When I go back and I preach what the old timers used to preach, when Peter said, neither is thou salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Did he not say that? Of course he said that. Because he's God. So I'm not looking for the religion of the Antichrist. It's already here. I'm in a mortal battle with it every day of my life. And that's what I'm preaching to you about this morning. That during these 18 silent years, this garbage is going to flood into the churches. Along with Dan Brown, when he said that Christ and Mary Magdalene had children, the Da Vinci Code. You know the story of Leonardo da Vinci. John's head on the, on the bosom of Christ wasn't really John. It was Mary Magdalene. But it was coded because of the time he lived. All this stuff. Nice little twisting story there. But the bottom line is that we have a whole generation of people that have been raised up that doubt completely the story in the Bible about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they believe that he was just another one like us. But he had a special anointing on him. He had a special spirit that came upon him. And folks, that's exactly what the Gnostics taught 2,000 years ago. They taught that at Christ's baptism, an unction came down upon him. And it stayed on him till he went to the cross. And then at the cross, it left him. Amen. They've been, been teaching that now for, for a long time. I hadn't been at this church long when I got a book written by Constance Cumby. How many ever heard of Constance Cumby? She's a lawyer. Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. That's the title of her book. It's an outstanding book, especially since it's 30-something years old. In that book, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, this woman talks about the New Age movement and how it is infiltrating the churches. How it's all, and that was 30 something years ago. Imagine how far it is now. And I started preaching about the New Age movement 30 something years ago, right here at Temple Baptist Church. Well, the other day I got, a, I got, a, I got an email from a lady up in New York who's going to be here the first of June, the first Sunday in June, who was a guru in the New Age movement. I've listened to her testimony about three times now. You know why? Because she's got something to say. Amen. That's why. And I'll probably listen to it a couple more times because I'm going to use some of the material out of her testimony tonight. You ought to hear what she has to say. You ought to hear what this woman says. She was a guru. 
She had 50,000 followers on her blog. And she was a, she was a, 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 was a, a, a teacher, a master of the New Age movement. And she is going to come to Temple Baptist Church the first Sunday in June. Why would she come here? Why would you think she'd come to this church? Why would a, why would a lady from New York want to come down here to Knoxville, Tennessee and come to this church? You know why? Because of something that I was preaching to you just a few minutes ago. Because of what's being preached in this church. Because of what I just told you. The churches today are asleep. We get people, I get up here and I try to preach this. I try to tell you what's going on. I try to waken you. I try to, this is not easy. I fight a battle day after day with spiritual forces over this. This is not easy. This is rough. But I've got to do it. I've got to do it. And yet some people, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. All they want to hear is praise and worship. Feel good. They want to live in their little spiritual cocoon. Let me tell you something about your spiritual cocoon. You're in for a wake-up call. And when it hits, it's going to hit you hard. Because you're going to be surprised when it comes crashing down. A wake-up call. I listened to a lady the other night, a precious born-again lady, giving her testimony of how she was raised. She said, my daddy was a preacher. And some folks even called him a prophet. She said, my daddy called us, called us in one day and said, now daughter, family, the Lord told me I'm going home today. That's what she said. The Lord told me I'm going home today. And you know what? He went home that day. But here's what she said. She said, my daddy would go down to the church house and he'd go down there by himself and he didn't want anybody in there. He wanted to be alone. And he'd get down there and he'd start praying. And she said, something began to happen in that church house. He would spend hours on his knees praying to Amen. God. Amen. We're not all called to do the same thing. It takes you a while to grow in grace and knowledge in the Lord to understand what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 said, we're not all the head, we're not all eyes, we're not all ears. We all have our ministry. It takes you a while to find your ministry. I've told you time and time and time again, my ministry is to preach and teach the word of God. That's my ministry. But you know what she said? She said, and this is, this is important, she said, I wouldn't tell my daddy I was going, but I would sneak into the church and I'd sneak off in the corner somewhere and I'd sneak in there just so I could hear him pray, just so I could hear my daddy pray. Amen. And she said, when he started praying, it did something to me. I could feel the power of God come into that church house. Amen. Well, that's something. Amen. That's something. That's something. We need that. We got a good church here. God's blessed this church. The Holy Ghost has moved in this house and he's going to move more in this house. I've seen God do things at Temple Baptist Church recently that literally blew my mind. The power of God has moved on Temple Baptist Church. One of the reasons that the power of God has moved on Temple Baptist Church because he honors his word. If all I did was get up here and give you a feel-good morality week in, week out, be good, you do good to this one, you help this one, you do good, be good here, be, that's nothing, that's garbage. Amen, you need to know where you are. You need to know what world you're living in and how to deal with these issues as they come upon you. Amen. You need to understand that. And God has blessed Temple Baptist Church. Amen. Blessed it. He's blessed it. God has blessed the ministry. I got up here and preached a message on hell just a few weeks ago. Just a few weeks ago. It was as certain I told you when I preached it. I said, God wants me to preach this. I said, this is for somebody. Remember me telling you that? I'm as certain as for me breathing and my heart beating. I said, God told me to preach this. 
Well, in this congregation, we didn't see a whole lot happen. But I got an email the other day. These two women came in, and they heard that message, and they both got saved. Amen. That's happening everywhere. That's happening all over the place. God, folks, is ministering through Temple Baptist Church to far more people than what you see sitting here right now. And there are far more people right now listening to this, con to this message than what you're seeing sitting around you right now. They're out there listening. I'm reluctant to tell you that because I don't want you to think that I'm bragging on myself. But I want you to know God has put his hand on this place. He has a reason for you being here. There's a reason for this ministry. It's reaching people, a lot of people. Amen. Edna Moreland told me the other day, she said, I got 800 emails. 800. So what does that represent, preacher? How, how, many, how, many, how much time does that represent? We're talking about what, a week? About a week, a little over a week. 800 emails. And so... It averages, what, 800 a week then? Yeah. All right. That's 3,200 emails a month. That's for a four-week month. These are people that write in. Do you know what they're writing about? Preacher, would you please pray for this? Preacher, I'd love to talk to you. Preacher, my husband left me. My wife left me. My kids are in rebellion. Preacher, we have no church. You're our church. Over and over and over and over again, they say, Preacher, Temple Baptist Church is our church. There was a man here last Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Right before he walked out, he said, Preacher, he said, we meet and we watch this church. This is our church. This is our church. You are ministering, folks, out here. When I preach a message like I preached to you this morning now, I only got part of it. But when I preach you a message like I preached right here, I'm preaching it far past and I've got that conscious on my mind now all the time. It's going far past what, what you hear in here. They're hearing it out there, and they're hearing it. Because where they live, they don't hear anything. Pray for this church. Don't let anybody put it down. God's using this church. Anybody that tries to put Temple Baptist Church down is a hand of the devil trying to destroy the ministry of this church that's reaching a lot of people. God can do a thing any way he pleases. I've been here for almost, I've been here over 40 years, and let me tell you something. He has never done it before like he's doing it now. The church has a completely different ministry than it did before. Would you pray about that? Would you pray about what went forth? Would you pray about people who don't have anything? They don't have anything. They got nothing. They got nothing out there. They live in these big cities. They live, they live, they, they have nothing. And they come because they want to hear the word of God and God's reaching them. We'll finish it tonight. I'd like to invite you to come back. I'd like, you to, I'd like to invite you to come back and get into some stuff with me tonight that you need to hear. Very, very, very important stuff. This is the kind of thing that will help you. And prepare you for the second coming of Christ. So you'll be able to warn your husbands and your wives and your children and your family members. Because you're going to see it firsthand. What I'm preaching in here, you're going to see it out there firsthand. It's out there. Father, in thy name we pray. I ask you now to use it. Use what's been said this morning. And Father, there's some people in here, Lord, and out there watching this thing live. And they'll watch it later. They're in desperate need. They're in desperate need. They're about at the end of their rope. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. They don't know which way to turn. They have no idea. I pray for that one. I pray for that soul. Lord, I pray for that soul. I pray you bless your word now as it goes forth. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.